Hey everybody, it's Nate from Explorers.life. We teach people how to build DIY campers. In this video, we are showing you start to finish how we installed this complete DIY electrical system in our Ford Transit camper van. Now this video is going to cover wiring the battery bank, building the enclosure, wiring the battery heater, the link shunt and links distributor, rooftop solar, ground deploy solar, the multi-plus inverter charger, the chassis ground, 24 volt air conditioning, dual 12 volt fuse blocks, wiring shore power, alternator charging, wiring the Servo GX and Touch 70, securing the batteries to the van, and system programming and testing. Now, if at any point in time you want to skip to a specific section of the video, we've put timestamps in the video timeline below so you can do just that. Now, two things before we get started. First, there are a ton of resources that accompany this video like wiring diagrams, parts lists, plans, 3D models, and all kinds of other fun stuff that you'll want to check out the video description for. And secondly, this video is kicking off the expansion of shop.explorers.life that we launched last year. In the past, we've pushed everybody to Amazon to buy the parts necessary to build these systems, but unfortunately, we didn't have any control over quality or them keeping items in stock. So we've brought all of that in-house, and Steph has been hard at work sourcing the parts and components for the system you're seeing today, and a few new systems that we've just launched for larger systems, smaller systems, and systems for 30 amp and 50 amp OEM RVs. Now, enough with the sales pitch. Let's get started. To start this project, we needed to wire our two 12-volt Battleborn GC3 batteries together to make a 24-volt battery bank. Now these batteries are the backbone of the system, providing 6.8 kilowatt hours of power storage, which is 270 amp hours at 24 volts, or 540 amp hours at 12 volts. Now these batteries are also self-heating since we travel for snow skiing and live up in the mountains of Colorado, where temps as low as negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit are typical in the winter. Here are the parts we are using for this part of the installation. Two heated 12 volt, 270 amp hour Battleborn GC3 lithium iron phosphate batteries. The Explorers Life 2 battery 1 aught 24 volt battery bank wiring kit, which includes wire, wire lugs, heat shrink, and we also need the terminal fuse and terminal fuse holder from our 24 volt 1 aught Lynx distributor wiring kit. Let's start wiring. To make a 24 volt battery bank from two 12 volt batteries, we need to wire the positive from one battery to the negative terminal of the other battery. And to do this, I flipped one of the batteries upside down so that the positive and negative terminals were near each other. These Battleborn batteries can be mounted in any orientation, which is a huge perk for giving us mounting flexibility in these systems. With the batteries in position, I could unscrew the terminal covers. Now these batteries are internally heated so that they continue to function during extreme cold temperatures, but we still have to wire them up externally, and to do that, we need to access the heater screw terminal, which is under this mounting foot. Once we have access to the heater screw terminal, we need to make the heater wire. So, I crimped a ring terminal onto our small gauge wire, secured the ring terminal in place to the heater screw, and then replaced the battery mounting foot. Now it was time to make the battery interconnect wire to make these two 12 volt Battleborn batteries into a 24 volt battery bank. So I cut, stripped, crimped, and heat shrinked a 1 aught by 5 16 inch wire lug onto each end of a short piece of wire and put 3 quarter inch heat shrink on each end. Then I sanded and cleaned the lugs and clean the battery terminals with alcohol to get rid of any manufacturing oil, dirt, or grime. Next, I bolted the lugs directly to the battery terminals with the hardware included with the batteries. Now, it's super important to make sure that there's nothing between the lugs and the battery terminals like heat shrink or washers, and then tighten that to spec with a half inch wrench and socket. And here's how the battery terminal connection should look. The lug should be directly in contact with the battery terminal with washers on each side. And lastly, we can replace the battery terminal covers. Now that our batteries are wired together, it's time to mount these two batteries to their base, and that's coming up next. Now that our two 12 volt Battleborn batteries are wired together into a 24 volt battery bank, we need to mount the batteries to a base so that they stay put during travel. 
I measured out a piece of birch plywood to fit the bottom of the batteries and cut it to fit. Next I made the tongue part of our tongue and groove joint that would eventually fit into our 8020 base. I simply ran the wood across the table saw until I had a protrusion that would fit nicely into the slot of the 8020 and be flush on the bottom. A router and router table would have been much easier and cleaner here, but alas, I don't have a router table yet, so the table saw and chisel method worked good enough for who it's for. Next I marked and drilled the holes for the battery mounting feet. I sanded and finished the wood with paste wax. And then we secured the batteries to the wood with number 10 by 2 inch long machine screws and stop nuts. With these screws in place, our Battleborn batteries are now firmly attached to the base and effectively each other. With the batteries firmly mounted to the base, we can now move on to building the 8020 enclosure that will secure the batteries to the body of the van and protect the rest of the components, and that's coming up next. Now that we've secured the batteries to the platform, it's time to start building our aluminum extrusion enclosure. Now, it's also worth noting that I use the term 8020 and aluminum extrusion pretty interchangeably in this video. Aluminum extrusion is just the general name for this type of material, and 8020 is a brand name. Now we need to flip our batteries over so that they are right side up, but first we need to make the base of the aluminum extrusion enclosure to slip it into place. Our enclosure started with a plan. Steph and I spent a few days brainstorming what the enclosure would look like and how it would fit into the future layout of the van, and we came up with this design in SketchUp. Now if you want this SketchUp file, be sure to check out that info in the pinned comment below this video. With the plan in place, we ordered the aluminum extrusion. We ordered our aluminum extrusion from T-Nuts because they have pretty quick turnaround and they will also pre-cut and machine the pieces for us, which saves a lot of time, effort, and wasted material for minimal cost. It's super nice to have the material show up at our door, 95% of the way finished, and all we have to do is make a few strategic access holes and bolt it together. To bolt the extrusion together, we had T-nuts tap threads in the ends and then counterbore access holes in adjacent ends, and the pieces simply bolt together like so. This method is super strong, but maybe even more importantly, it keeps everything very square and flush with each other. There are a few places though that we had to drill our own access holes. In some places, the bolts needed to be halfway down the extrusion, so we had to do that ourselves. We used a drill press for this, but you can absolutely just use a hand drill for this as long as you can accurately drill straight up and down. With the aluminum extrusion base completed, we slid the base around the wood platform and then tightened it into place. Now that the battery base is complete, we can go ahead and flip the whole assembly over and wire the other side of the battery heater while we still have access to it. And that's coming up next. Now that the battery bank is secured to the base of the enclosure, it's time to wire the other battery heater circuit before we lose easy access to the terminal screw. I took the positive battery terminal cover and the mounting foot off of the battery to gain access to the screw terminal for the heater of this battery. I grabbed the other end of the heater wire that I attached to the other battery and crimped a ring terminal onto it. Next I made a short piece of wire with a number 8 ring terminal on one side and a 5 16 inch terminal on the other side. I put the two number 8 ring terminals in place and tightened them to an appropriate torque. The other end of the short wire goes to the positive battery terminal. Now is also a good time to install the terminal fuse that comes with our Lynx distributor wiring kit. I put the bolt that comes with the batteries through the battery terminal, fuse holder, and small 5 16 inch ring terminal and tighten to spec. Now I'm going to put the positive terminal cover back in place. It's important to keep the negative battery terminal cover in place the entire time during this step because touching the positive and negative terminals at the same time with my wrench or ratchet would cause a lot of heat very quickly. Now that the battery heating circuit is complete, we can continue building the aluminum extrusion enclosure and that's coming up next. Now that we have the battery heating circuit complete, we can reinstall the mounting foot and continue building the aluminum extrusion enclosure. Building the rest of the aluminum extrusion enclosure was more of the same concept for building the base. 
we just use our SketchUp file to go in a systematic method for attaching all of the extrusions into place. Once we got to this piece on the front of the enclosure, it was time to secure the tops of the batteries to the extrusion. Battleborn makes brackets for the GC3 batteries and we're attaching those brackets to the aluminum extrusion with one inch long quarter by 20 carriage bolts and stop nuts. The other ends of the brackets get secured to the batteries with the hardware included with the brackets. For the lid support piece, we slid T-nuts into the end of the extrusion, which the hinges would eventually bolt to. The T-nuts we used could have actually been dropped in from the top, as we found out later, but it goes in from the end as well. Next, we built the lid in much of the same way we built the rest of the enclosure. Now this process involves a ton of putting pieces together and taking them apart to make it all fit. It's a bit of a tedious process, but persistence and patience pays off here. We found it best to build all of the 8020 first to make sure that everything bolts together properly before making the panels. Now we are using clear acrylic panels for this enclosure because we plan on taking it to camper van shows and we'll be using this system as a teaching tool. If we weren't using it for that purpose, we could really use any other type of sheet goods like colored acrylic or even plywood. The panels simply slide into place in most places, but in a few spots, the panels needed to be notched out for clearance. Now this is my first time working with acrylic, and it actually handled similar to wood in most regards. I pretty much just used normal woodworking tools here. The acrylic was more brittle than wood, and it threw a lot more melted plastic shrapnel when cutting it, but I didn't have to upgrade to a plastic-specific blade or anything like that. Once the panels were made, we could attach the lid. We put the lid in place, dropped our T-nuts into the top piece of extrusion, and bolted the hinges together. <laughs> to keep the lid closed, we're using these black chest latches. For these, we marked the location of the holes, drilled the holes, and tapped threads into them, and then screwed the latches to the enclosure. The last thing we wanted to do was add some gas struts to keep the lid open and to slow the lid down as it closed. Unfortunately, I bought the wrong size of gas strut, and my gas strut mounting design just didn't really work, so this enclosure is not getting gas struts for now. And I'll have to come up with another solution later, but I'll be sure to put the updated solution in the pinned comment below this video once I figure it out. Now that the enclosure is all built, we can set it aside for a bit and install the rest of the components on the wall of the van, and that's coming up next. Now that the enclosure is built and our battery bank is wired, we can move on to wiring all of the Victron components, starting with the Link Shunt and Link's distributor. The Link Shunt is a measuring device that measures the amperage leaving or going back into the battery bank. Think of this like the fuel gauge for your battery bank. The Lynx distributor is a system of positive and negative bus bars with fuse holders for the positive bus bars. This is the absolute best way to get nice and organized fused wire runs with minimal electrical connections into a system. Now here's a rundown of these two products and how to install them. These products come with covers that can be removed to access their internal components. Let's start with the Lynx shunt, which has a space for an ANL fuse, which protects the Lynx distributor, and acts as a backup to the terminal fuse that we installed on the battery bank. And a shunt, which is actually the measuring device that I mentioned earlier. The Lynx distributor has a positive bus bar, a negative bus bar, four fuse holders per Lynx distributor, little breakaway separators that we don't need, and wire separators that snap into place or out of the way as necessary. A second Lynx distributor can simply be added to the first Lynx distributor if additional fuse slots are needed, which in this video we will indeed need the additional spots. So I can remove the hardware, clean the electrical points of contact with alcohol, 
put the second links distributor in place, and reattach and retorque the hardware. The link shunt mounts to the first links distributor in the exact same method. Clean the points of contact, remove the hardware, put it in place, put the hardware back in place, and tighten it down. The link shunt powers the lights inside of the links distributors with the data cables provided with the links distributors. They simply attach to their respective spots in each device. These cables are a bit too long, so I'm just coiling them up and out of the way a bit so they don't hang down out of the link system so far. Now we can put our fuse in place in the Lynx distributor by removing the hardware, cleaning the fuse, dropping the fuse into place, and replacing and retorquing the hardware. The fuse should be directly in contact with the Lynx shunt with no washers or anything in between. Now it's ready to mount to the wall. Now that our link shunt and both links distributors are all connected to each other and mounted to the wall, it's time to wire our first solar charge controller into the system. And that's coming up next. Now that I mounted the links distributor to the wall, I'm going to show you how to wire the first solar charge controller in the system to the links distributor. This charge controller is responsible for taking the 580 watt solar array on the roof of this van that operates at a bit over 40 volts and regulating that voltage down to the 29 volts that it takes to charge a 24 volt battery bank. Here are the parts we are using for this part of the installation. The Victron Smart Solar MPPT-130, the Explorus Life MPPT-130 wiring kit, which includes wire, ferrules, wire lugs, heat shrink, a mega fuse, and mounting screws. The Victron Smart Solar MPPT-130 solar charge controller has six terminals we will be using. Battery positive, battery negative, solar array negative, solar array positive, an equipment ground screw, and the VE Direct port for system communications with the Serbo GX. Now let's start wiring. We first want to temporarily mount the charge controller to the wall so that we can take our measurements for our wires, which involves securing the charge controller with two number 14 screws in the pilot holes that we pre-drilled. Next we needed to make our wires. To make our positive wire, we will cut, strip, crimp, and heat shrink a 6 gauge by 5 16 inch wire lug onto one end of our red 6 gauge wire, and then measure, cut, strip, crimp, and heat shrink a 6 gauge ferrule onto the other side. To make our negative wire, we are doing the exact same thing, just with a black wire and black heat shrink. I crimped a 6 gauge ferrule onto one end, and a 6 gauge by 5 16 inch wire lug onto the other, both with half inch black heat shrink. Lastly, to make our equipment ground wire, I crimped a 6 gauge by quarter inch wire lug onto one side of the wire and a 6 gauge by 5 16 inch wire lug onto the other end, both with half inch black heat shrink. Now we can wire the charge controller to the Lynx distributor. I started with the equipment ground wire because the screw is on the side of the charge controller and it's kind of hard to get to, requiring the removal of the charge controller from the wall. I removed the equipment ground screw, placed the serrated washer, lug, washer, and lock washer in place, and then secured all of that with the equipment ground screw. The other end of this will get attached to the MultiPlus equipment ground stud later in this video, so I'm just going to leave it hanging for now. Next, we can clean off our positive ferrule with a bit of alcohol and put it into the positive battery terminal of the MPPT, tighten to spec, and then clean the negative ferrule and put it into the negative battery terminal and tighten that to spec. Lastly, I'll ensure that there is no insulation between the ferrule and the terminal. 
Now that I've connected the wires to the charge controller, we can connect the battery positive and negative wires to the Lynx distributor. I'm going to pull the wire separator out of the way for now, and then I'm going to loosen and remove the nuts, lock washers, and washers from the furthest rightmost terminals of the Lynx distributor with a 13 millimeter deep well socket. Next, I will clean the electrical points of contact with the bit of sandpaper and alcohol as appropriate and put the negative lug on the negative bus bar stud in the Lynx distributor. It's important to ensure no insulation is interfering between the lug and bus bar at this point. Then I will replace the washer, lock washer, and nut on the stud, tighten it to the manufacturer's torque spec, and replace the wire separator. Next I will clean my electrical points of contact on the positive wire and fuse, put my mega fuse in place, put the positive lug in place on the bottom stud of the fuse holder, and then replace the washers, lock washers, and nuts on the bus bar and fuse holder, and tighten to spec. Now that the charge controller for our roof-mounted solar array is connected to the Lynx distributor, now we can wire the charge controller to our solar isolator. I already put 10 gauge ferrules and 3 8 inch heat shrink from the Explorus Life Solar Array wiring kit on these wires coming from the solar isolator ahead of time since they are pretty short and hard to work with once the charge controller is in place. The red wire goes into the PV positive terminal and the black wire goes into the negative PV terminal, and both get tightened to spec. It's crucial to ensure that the ferrules insulation is out of the way and is not interfering with the connection here. Now that I have the first charge controller installed, it's time to move on and install the second charge controller for our ground deploy solar array, which is coming up next. Now that I've installed the first charge controller of this system for the rooftop solar array, I'm going to show you how to wire a second charge controller into the same system for our ground deploy solar array. This charge controller is for a ground deploy solar array that we can place away from the van for supplemental charging while parked at camp. This charge controller can handle a solar array of up to a massive 1700 watts of solar panels. It can handle an array voltage of up to 250 volts and regulate that down to the 29 volts that it takes to charge a 24 volt battery bank. Here are the parts we are using for this part of the install. The Victron Smart Solar MPPT-25060 and the Explorers Life MPPT-25060 wiring kit, which includes wire, ferrules, wire lugs, heat shrink, a mega fuse, and mounting screws. The Victron Smart Solar MPPT-25060 solar charge controller has six terminals that we'll be using. Battery positive, battery negative, solar array negative, solar array positive, an equipment ground screw, and the VE direct port for system communications with the Serbo GX. Let's start wiring. We first want to temporarily mount the charge controller to the wall so that we can take the measurements for our wires, which simply involves securing the charge controller with two number 14 screws in the pilot holes that we pre-drilled. Next, we need to make our wires. We measured our two gauge positive wire and then crimped a two gauge by 5 16 inch wire lug onto one side and a two gauge ferrule on the other side. Each get three quarter inch heat shrink. For the negative wire, I'll do the exact same thing. I crimped on a 2 gauge by 5 16 inch wire lug onto one side and a 2 gauge ferrule on the other, both with 3 quarter inch heat shrink. For the equipment ground wire, this one gets a 2 gauge by 5 16 inch lug on one side and a 2 gauge by quarter inch lug on the other, both with 3 quarter inch heat shrink. Now that I've made the wires, I can wire the charge controller to the Lynx distributor. I started with the equipment ground wire because the screw is on the side of the charge controller and is hard to get to, requiring removal of the charge controller. Then I remove the equipment ground screw and then place the serrated washer 
lug, washer, and lock washer in place and secured all of that with the equipment ground screw. The other end of this will get attached to the MultiPlus equipment ground stud later in this video, so I'm just going to leave it hanging for now. Next we can clean off our positive ferro with a bit of alcohol and put it into the positive battery terminal and then clean the negative ferrule, put it into the negative battery terminal, and then tighten that to spec. Lastly, I'll ensure that there is no insulation between the ferrule and the terminal. Now it's time to connect the battery positive and negative wires to the Lynx distributor. I'm going to pull the wire separator out of the way, loosen and remove the nuts, lock washers, and washers from the Lynx distributor, clean the electrical points of contact with some alcohol, put the negative lug on the negative bus bar stud in the Lynx distributor, ensure that there's no insulation between the lug and bus bar, replace the washer, lock washer and nut on the stud, tighten the nut to the manufacturer's spec, and then replace the wire separator. For the positive wire, I'm going to clean my electrical points of contact on the positive wire and fuse, put my mega fuse in place, put the positive lug in place on the bottom stud of the fuse holder, replace the washers, lock washers, and nuts on the bus bar and fuse holder, and then tighten to spec. Now that I have the charge controller for our ground mounted solar array wired to the Lynx distributor, I can connect the wires from the solar isolator. Now I already put the 10 gauge ferrules and quarter inch heat shrink on these wires from the solar isolator ahead of time since they are pretty short and hard to work with once the charge controller is in place. The red wire goes into the PV positive terminal, and the black wire goes into the negative PV terminal and both get tightened to spec. It's vital to ensure that the ferrule's insulation is out of the way and is not interfering with the connection here. Now that I have the second charge controller installed in the system, it's time to move on to wiring the Victron MultiPlus inverter charger, which is coming up next. Now that I have both solar charge controllers wired to the Lynx distributor, it's time to move on down the line of blue boxes and wire our Victron MultiPlus inverter charger to the Lynx distributor. The Victron MultiPlus will allow us to do three different things in this system. Charge our 24 volt batteries from 120 volt shore power, power our 120 volt outlets from shore power, and power our 120 volt outlets from our 24 volt battery bank. For this section of the build, we are using these parts. The Victron MultiPlus 24 volt 3K inverter charger and the Explorus Life 24 volt MultiPlus 3K wiring kit, which includes wire, wire lugs, heat shrink, a mega fuse, and MultiPlus mounting hardware. The Victron MultiPlus has 10 terminals that we will be using in this build positive and negative battery inputs, hot neutral and ground AC inputs from shore power, hot, neutral, and ground AC outputs to the 120 volt breaker box, an equipment ground terminal, and the VE bus terminal for communications with the Servo GX. Let's get started. I fasten the MultiPlus mounting plate to the wall with the five flathead screws that come with the MultiPlus wiring kit. The MultiPlus simply rests on the mounting plate with the lip on the back and hangs there. The bottom gets screwed to the wall as well, but we will do that later once we're certain that we don't have to move the MultiPlus. With the MultiPlus mounted to the wall, I remove the front cover so that we can access all of the electrical connections. I measured the 1-aught wire for both the positive and negative connections and crimped a 1-aught by 5 16 inch wire lug onto each end with 3 quarter inch heat shrink. Next it was time to move back over to the MultiPlus and remove the nut, lock washer, and washer from one of the studs on each of the positive and the negative terminals. After cleaning the connections, I put the black wire on the negative terminal and the red wire on the positive terminal, and then fasten both in place with the washer, lock washer, and nut, 
and tightened it to an appropriate torque. The equipment ground wire goes underneath the MultiPlus on the stud at the very back corner. This stud is also where we land the equipment ground wires for the solar charge controllers. After removing the hardware from the MultiPlus equipment ground stud, I replace the serrated washer, one OT lug, two gauge lug from the MPPT-25060, six gauge lug from the MPPT-130, washer, lock washer, and nut, and then tightened to an appropriate torque. Next is time to connect the equipment ground wire to the Lynx distributor. I loosen the nut, lock washer, and washer, put the equipment ground lug in place on the negative bus bar of the Lynx distributor, and then replace the washer, lock washer, and nut, and then tightened it to spec. Next is connecting the MultiPlus positive and negative wires from the MultiPlus to the Lynx distributor. I remove the nuts, washers, and lock washers from the negative bus bar and positive fuse holder in the Lynx distributor. And then I clean my wire lugs with a bit of sandpaper and alcohol. Then I put my negative wire lug in place on the negative bus bar and replace the washer, lock washer, and nut and then tighten to spec. And then I replace the wire separator. Next I remove the little red ring terminal from the stud that goes to the Lynx distributor computer board. Drop my mega fuse in place, put the PCB ring terminal back in place, put my positive wire lug in place directly on top of the fuse, and then replace the washers, lock washers, and nuts and then tightened it to spec. Now that the DC side of the Victron MultiPlus is all wired up, we still need to wire the AC input and AC output for the MultiPlus, but I'm going to keep going with the DC wiring of the system and get everything connected to the Lynx distributor. Let's move on to wiring the chassis ground. Now that I have wired the MultiPlus to the Lynx distributor, it's time to wire the chassis ground. For this part of the install, we're using the one aught variety of the Explorers Life chassis ground wiring kit, which includes wire, wire lugs, heat shrink, a nut, bolt, washer, lock washer, and serrated washer. Before we installed the walls, we wired the chassis ground connection to the van's body. We used one of the body support ribs for this. This connection is as simple as drilling a 5 16 inch hole in the support rib and then bolting our one out by 5 16 inch wire lug to the body support rib with the serrated washer between the lug and rib. And the washer, lock washer, and nut on the other side of the rib and then tightening until snug. Since this was pretty hard to see back in that dark and tight corner, here's how that looks on a tabletop demonstration. The serrated washer is in between the lug and body panel, and then the washer, lock washer, and nut are on top of that, all bolted together nice and tight. The serrated washer cuts through the van's paint, giving a good metal-to-metal -metal connection. If you feel this is not enough of a connection, feel free to sand away some paint at your discretion. Back to real time now, with the walls already installed. I already crimped on a one aught by 5 16 inch wire lug onto this end of the chassis ground wire and fed it through the wall. This chassis ground wire gets attached to the center stud on the negative bus bar of the Lynx distributor. I pulled the negative connection for the Lynx distributor PCB out of the way, put the lug directly on the negative bus bar, replace the ring terminal for the PCB, and the washer, lock washer, and nut directly on top of that, and all tightened to spec. Now that we have wired the chassis ground connection, it's time to wire our 24 volt nomadic air conditioner, which is coming up next. Now that we have installed our chassis ground, it's time to wire our 24 volt nomadic air conditioner to the Lynx distributor. 
The Nomadic 24 volt air conditioner is the air conditioner that we installed back in episode 21 of this build series. So most of the wiring is already completed. We connected the two gauge wires to the air conditioner and the lugs we already crimped onto the ends for bench testing the unit. We already ran those wires through the walls and now we just need to connect those to the Lynx distributor. I removed the hardware from the negative bus bar of the Lynx distributor and then put the negative wire lug in place and replaced the washer, lock washer, and nut on top and tightened it to an appropriate torque. Next, I removed the nut, lock washer, and washer from the positive bus bar and bottom stud of the fuse holder of the Lynx distributor, and I put my mega fuse in place, and then I put my positive wire lug on the bottom stud on top of the fuse, and then I replaced the washers, lock washers, and nuts, and tightened them to an appropriate torque. Now that I have the air conditioner wired, it's time to move on to wiring our 12 volt fuse blocks, which is coming up next. Now that I have wired the air conditioner, it's time to wire our 12 volt fuse blocks for our small loads like lights, fans, USB outlets, and such. I'm gonna break this section into two parts, installing the Victron Orion 24 volt to 12 volt converter and installing our dual fuse blocks. The Orion 24 volt to 12 volt converter is responsible for lowering the 24 volt battery bank voltage to 12 volts to provide up to 70 amps of power to all of our lights, fans, USB outlets, and other small 12 volt loads around the van. Here are the parts we are using for this part of the installation. The Victron Orion 24 volt to 12 volt 70 amp converter, two 12 volt fuse panels, and the Explorus Life Orion 2412 70 amp converter wiring kit, which includes wire, wire lugs, insulated ferrules, heat shrink, a mega fuse, and mounting hardware. Plus the Explorus Life secondary fuse block add-on wiring kit, which includes wire, insulated ferrules, and additional mounting hardware. The Orion 2412 70 amp converter has three different terminals that we will be using. The positive input terminal, the positive output terminal, and the negative terminal. The 12 volt fuse panels that we are using have three different terminal areas. Two six gauge positive connections, a negative bus bar, positive terminals for the branch circuits, and the blade fuse slots on the front. Now let's start wiring. Before we installed the walls, we ran the positive and negative 6 gauge wire from our Victron Orion 24 to 12 volt wiring kit from the electrical enclosure area up to where the first fuse block would live. I stubbed those wires out of the wall and put 6 gauge by quarter inch wire lugs with half inch heat shrink on each. I also made some short 6 gauge wires that would go from the Lynx distributor to the Orion terminals with a 6 gauge by 5 16 inch wire lug and half inch heat shrink on one side, and a 6 gauge by quarter inch wire lug and half inch heat shrink on the other side. Getting started, I secured the Orion to the wall with the screws included in the Orion 2412 wiring kit. Then I removed the nuts, washers, and lock washers from the side of the Orion and set them aside. Then I made sure that this little wire bridge was in place. The Orion will not function without this in place, so it's important that it's there. Next, I put the lugs that go to the 12 volt fuse block on the negative and 12 volt positive output studs of the Orion. And then after that, I removed the nuts, lock washers, and washers from the three studs of the Lynx distributor. And then I attached the short negative wire from the negative stud of the Orion to the negative bus bar on the Lynx distributor. Next, I put the washers, lock washers, and nuts back on the negative stud of the Orion and the Lynx distributor and tightened the spec and finally put the wire separator back in place. After that, I put the mega fuse in place on the fuse holder on the positive bus bar and then put my positive wire in place between the fuse holder of the Lynx distributor and the 24 volt input of the Orion converter. Then I put my washers, lock washers, and nuts back on the Lynx distributor and tighten the spec. 
and then replace the washers, lock washers, and nuts back on the Orion and tighten those to spec. Now that the Orion converter has been installed, I can move on downstream and wire the 12 volt fuse blocks. Now we are wiring two separate 12 volt fuse panels here. One on the driver's side of the van and one on the passenger side. Both of them are powered from the same Orion 24 volt to 12 volt converter. And here's how to wire the first one. We already ran the six gauge wires from the electrical enclosure up here to the fuse panel before we installed the walls. So we pulled those out stripped back some insulation, and crimped six gauge insulated ferrules onto each wire. There are two positive terminals on the back of the 12 volt fuse block. We're connecting the positive wire from the Orion converter into one of these terminals, and then connecting the wire that goes to the second fuse block to the other terminal. Which one goes to which does not matter as they are both connected internally. The negative wire from the Orion goes to any of these spots on the negative bus bar. The negative wire to the second 12 volt fuse block goes to any remaining spots on the negative bus bar. Connecting all the branch circuits is just a matter of stripping back the insulation on each positive and negative wire and putting them into their proper places on the fuse block. The negatives go to any spaces on the negative bus bar. The positives go to any spaces on the positive terminals on the other side. Wiring the second fuse block is nearly the same as the first, with the positive wire coming out from the first fuse block going to one of these positive terminals on the back of the fuse block. It doesn't matter which one though. And the negative wire goes to one of the spaces on the negative bus bar. Which one we choose here also does not matter. And same as the previous fuse block. All of the positive wires go to their positive terminals and negatives go to the negative bus bar. Now I can fasten both of the 12 volt fuse blocks with the screws included in the 12 volt fuse panel wiring kits. and we can insert the appropriately sized blade fuses in the front of their respective circuits on the back. Now is also a good time to label the circuits so we know which fuse goes to which circuit. Now that the Victron Orion 24 volt to 12 volt converter has been installed and wired to our 12 volt fuse panels, it's time to wire our 120 volt distribution panel, and that's coming up next. Now that I have the 12 volt fuse blocks wired up, it's time to wire our 120 volt AC distribution panel so that our multi-plus inverter charger can send power to our breaker box and our breaker box can send power to our 120 volt outlets. Here are the parts we are using for this part of the installation. A 120 volt AC distribution panel and the Explorus Life 120 volt AC distribution panel wiring kit, which includes wire, insulated ferrules, a 50 amp main breaker, heat shrink, a cable gland, and mounting hardware. We are also using two 20 amp tandem breakers. The 120 volt AC distribution panel here has three different electrical areas that we are focusing on. A negative bus bar, a ground bus bar, and the positive terminals that are in the bottoms of each breaker. Now let's start wiring. Before we installed the walls, we ran the 6-3 wire behind the walls that went from the Victron MultiPlus to the 120 volt AC distribution panel. I stubbed those wires out of the wall, stripped off the ends, and put the 6 gauge insulated ferrules on each wire. I was able to get the outer insulation of the 6-3 wire into the gland of the MultiPlus, but the way I got it in there, I don't necessarily recommend it, so I'm not going to show you how I did it. Instead, I'm going to refer you back to the 30 minute and 22 second mark in the last full install video I did to show you how I recommend making that work. The link to that video is in the pinned comment below. The black, white, and green wires go into the line, neutral, and ground terminals of AC output number one, and then tightened to an appropriate torque with a Phillips head screwdriver.
Now moving up to the 120 volt AC distribution panel. There are knockouts on the back of the 120 volt AC distribution panel for our wire gland, but where we are installing this panel, there wasn't enough room behind it, so I drilled a new hole in the side and installed my wire gland there. Next, I fed all of my wires through. 6-3 from the side and 12-3 through the back. Then I securely mounted the AC distribution panel to the wall. Next, I stripped back the outer sheath from all 12-3 wires going to our outlets and loosely grouped all black, white, and green wires to prepare for wiring. Wiring this box is really pretty simple. All of the green wires go to the bus bar in the back of the box. So I stripped off a bit of insulation from each wire, crimped on ferrules, loosened the screws on the ground bus bar, and then put the wires into the bus bar, and then tightened the screws. All of the white wires go to the bus bar in the front of the box in the exact same fashion. For the incoming 6-3 wires, they also go to their respective green and white bus bars with ferrules on each. The black wires attach to the breakers, and the breakers simply attach to the bottom rail of the breaker box and tilt up so that the metal spline goes into the back of the breaker. Make sure that you put your main incoming breaker and branch circuit outgoing breakers on the same side of the breaker box, because as you'll notice, there is a left side bus bar and a right side bus bar, and the two are not connected. I loosened the screw at the bottom of the breaker, stripped the insulation back, crimped on a 6 gauge insulated ferrule, inserted the wire into the 50 amp breaker, and tightened the screw. And the black wires from the 12-3 go into their own spaces on their own breakers, or tandem breakers in our case, and sometimes it is easier to remove the breakers to see what you're doing here. Please note how all breakers are on the same side of the box. The breakers must all be on the same side of the box for them to work. Also, don't forget to put the threaded ring on top of the gland, otherwise you have to undo things like I did here. The little metal clip that's taped to the inside of the breaker box gets screwed to the top of the box, which holds the main breaker in place. Now I can cut out the breaker knockouts, attach the lid to the breaker box, and label our circuits. Now that I have installed our 120 volt distribution panel, it's time to move on to wiring shore power, which is coming up next. Now that I've wired our 120 volt distribution panel, it's time to wire for shore power. Shore power will allow us to power our 120 volt outlets and charge our batteries directly from shore power at a campground. Here are the parts we are using for this part of the installation. The Explorus Life 30 amp shore power wiring kit, which includes wire, a 30 amp shore power inlet, ferrules, and mounting hardware. We're also using a 30 amp shore power cord and a 15 to 30 amp power adapter plug. The 103 wire coming out of the wall comes from the shore power inlet we installed back in episode number 5 of this series, which I'll link to in the video description below. I stubbed the 103 wire out of the wall and stripped back the outer sheath and in insulation. I also already put the 10 gauge insulated ferrules from the Explorus Life Shore Power Wiring Kit onto each of the ends. I fed the 103 wire up into the MultiPlus and put the black, white, and green wires into the line, neutral, and ground terminals of the AC input. Then I tightened them to an appropriate torque with a Phillips head screwdriver. Now that we are sure that we don't need to move this inverter, we can place the screws under the MultiPlus to hold it firmly in place. Now that I've wired the system for shore power, let's move on to alternator charging. 
Now that shore power is installed, let's talk about alternator charging. And here's the bad news. Unfortunately, we aren't going to cover alternator charging in this video, and here's why. We want really fast alternator charging capabilities, and we plan on using the 100 amp Victron Buck Boost to accomplish this. But supply chain issues have made it so that those aren't available to us, but more importantly, to all of you until December, and we weren't going to hold up this project until then because of that. Rest assured though, alternator charging will absolutely happen soon and it will get its own dedicated video. We've even planned ahead and that alternator charging source already has a spot dedicated to it in the Lynx distributor as well as a spot on the wall. Now, let's move on to wiring the Servo GX. Now that we've talked about alternator charging, it's time to wire our Servo GX. The Servo GX is responsible for everything to do with system monitoring, which will tell us our battery state of charge, charging wattages, discharging wattages, and a thousand other things that I can't fit into this 8 second section summary. Here are the parts we're using for this part of the installation. The Victron Servo GX, the Victron Touch 70 touchscreen monitor, the Touch 70 wall mount, the Explorus Life Servo GX monitoring wiring kit, which includes VE Direct data cables, RJ45 UTP data cables, and mounting hardware. And we're also using a third-party HDMI extension cable. The Servo GX has five different terminals that we're using in this video. VE Direct ports, VE Bus ports, VE CAN ports, an HDMI port, and a power input. Let's start wiring. The first connection would be to send power to the Servo GX. We are connecting the power wires that come with the Servo GX to the empty far right studs of the Lynx distributor. I remove the nut, lock washer, and washer, and place the ring terminal for the red wire on the positive bus bar and the black wire on the negative bus bar, and then re-secure the washers, lock washers, and nuts. For the rest of the connections, if you've ever wired up a desktop computer, the Servo GX is very similar. Just a lot of data cables going from the Servo GX to these other blue boxes that we've already installed. Here's the rundown of the connections. An RJ45 UTP cable from a VE bus port on the Servo GX to either of the VE bus ports on the MultiPlus inverter charger. A VE Direct cable from a VE Direct port on the Servo GX to the VE Direct port on the MPPT 25060. A VE Direct cable from a VE Direct port on the Servo GX to the VE Direct port on the MPPT 130. VE CAN terminators in the first VE CAN port on the Link shunt and in the second VE CAN port of the Servo GX. An RJ45 UTP cable to the second VE CAN port on the Link shunt to the first VE CAN port on the Servo GX. And the final connection is the HDMI connection for the Touch 70 GX monitor we have mounted above the slider door. But let's talk about that connection right now. The Victron Touch 70 GX has a wire pre-installed onto the back of it that contains both an HDMI cord and a USB cord. The HDMI wire transmits touchscreen data and the visual signal, and the USB cord sends power to the monitor from a USB outlet. This cord is about 5 feet long and would normally plug into the HDMI and USB ports of the Servo GX, which is easy enough, right? Here's our problem. Our preferred mounting location is about 15 feet away. After a talk with Victron, here's the not Victron approved, but should work in most cases, hack to make it work. Installing a USB extension and HDMI seems like the obvious solution, but the power sent via USB is not powerful enough to overcome the voltage drop of a longer USB cable, so that won't work. But what will work 
is connecting a high quality HDMI extension cable from the Touch 70 to the Serbo GX and then adding a dedicated USB outlet near where the Touch 70 GX monitor will be installed so that the USB outlet can just plug in without an additional extension. Before we ran the walls, I ran the HDMI extension cable, which I plugged into the Serbo GX. I connected the other end to the Touch 70 HDMI cable. For the USB outlet, I wired a USB outlet to our 12 volt fuse block that's above the door and plugged the Touch 70 into that. I tucked all that up nice and neat-ish behind the wall, uh, which is not the most elegant solution, but it's good enough for who it's for, and only myself and the six people still watching this video will ever know about it. Thanks for sticking around, by the way. While we are up here at the Touch 70, we can go ahead and mount it. We mounted the Touch 70 wall mount to the wall with the included screws, and then snapped the Touch 70 to the wall mount. Now, if you decide to do the HDMI extension hack, I strongly recommend bench testing this before burying all the wires to verify that the HDMI extension wire chosen does work since this is not a Victron approved kind of thing and any issues with the Touch 70 will likely stem from the use of the extension. With the Serbo GX and Touch 70 GX all wired up, we can mount the Serbo GX in place on the wall and do a little wire management. Now that I've wired the Serbo GX, everything on the wall is finally complete. Now we can move our battery bank enclosure in place and secure it to the van, which is coming up next. With everything on the wall completely wired together, it was time to move the batteries and enclosure into place. Now the batteries only weigh a total of 180 pounds combined, so they were actually pretty manageable to move around. The enclosure was held in place with L-Track bolts through the L-Track that we installed back in episode number 27 of this build series. Now with the enclosure in place, it's time to move on to wiring the battery bank to the link shunt, and that's coming up next. Now that the enclosure is secured to the van, it's time to wire our Battleborn batteries to the rest of the system through the link shunt. Here are the parts we are using for this part of the installation. The Explorers Life one aught Lynx Distributor Wiring Kit for the Lynx Shunt, which includes wire, wire lugs, heat shrink, a terminal fuse and fuse holder, a master disconnect switch, two bolt assemblies, a 300 amp ANL fuse, and mounting hardware. Now for this, I have made three wires a negative wire with a one aught by 5 16 inch lug on both ends, and two positive wires, each with a one aught by 5 16 inch lug on one end and a one aught by 3 8 inch lug on the other end. All of this gets 3 quarter inch heat shrink. Now I'm going to start on the link shunt side of things and bolt the 5 16 inch lugs of a positive and the negative wire to the terminals of the link shunt. Now since this is the main electrical point of the system, it's important to make sure that the lugs are clean and that there's no heat shrink between the lug and terminal. The black wire goes to the bottom negative bus bar of the link shunt and secured in place with a washer, lock washer, and nut, and tightened to an appropriate torque. And the red wire goes to the top positive bus bar of the link shunt and secured in place with a washer, lock washer, and nut, and tightened to an appropriate torque. The other end of the negative wire goes all the way back to the negative terminal of our battery bank. I'll remove the terminal cover, secure the negative wire lug to the negative battery terminal, and then replace the terminal cover. The other end of the positive wire with the 3 8 inch lug goes to the switch. Now, it doesn't matter which stud of the switch you attach this to. It does say input and output on the back of the switch, but that doesn't really matter, especially since the input and outputs of the switch could change depending on if the system is charging or discharging. The other positive wire gets attached to the other side of the switch with the 3 8 inch lug, and then tighten to spec. Now is a great time to verify that the master disconnect switch is set to off. The other end of that positive wire goes to the terminal fuse that we installed way back at the start of this video. 
Now before we turn the system on, let's go ahead and secure the switch in place with a machine screw and lock nut. Now this is a bit of an atypical way of mounting this switch, but I'm just kind of trying it out to see if I like it. And it's super nice because it does keep the terminals covered. Now that the link shunt is wired to our Battleborn battery bank, it's time to wire our solar isolator. And that's coming up next. Now that the link shunt is wired to our Battleborn battery bank through our master disconnect switch, it's time to wire our solar isolator so that we can disconnect the solar arrays as needed for system maintenance. Here are the parts we are using for this part of the installation. This section of the project uses the final few remaining pieces from the Explorus Life solar array wiring kit, which are the solar isolator, wire glands, and mounting hardware. The solar isolator we are using has eight screw terminals inside of it, and each one is connected top to bottom when the solar isolator is turned to on. This means that this isolator can handle two separate solar arrays, disconnecting both the positive and negative wires from each simultaneously. I removed the caps from the tops and bottoms of the isolator and then replaced them with the wire entry glands. Now first I mounted the solar isolator by putting machine screws through the front of the inside of the isolator box and through the panel and secured it on the backside with a washer and nylock nut. Now there are four pairs of solar wire sticking out of the wall here. Two pairs of them are going to each of the solar charge controllers that we've already wired up in this video, and the remaining two are coming from the solar arrays. One from the roof solar array, and one from the port on the side of the van for an auxiliary ground deploy array. For the wires coming from the roof solar array, we covered that in extreme depth back in episode number 25 of this build, so you'll want to check that out as we're now picking up exactly where that left off in that video and our rooftop solar array wires have been disconnected prior to working on these wires. For the ground deploy array, before we installed the walls, we installed this DC power port into the side of the van. Installation here was similar to our shore power port. We taped off and drilled a hole, wired the connector with the red wire to pin 1 and the black wire to pin 2, added a zip tie for strain relief, fed the wires through the hole, and secured the port in place with bolts, washers, lock washers, and nylock nuts. Now we'll show the ground deploy array and wiring in action later, but back to the isolator wiring for now. Now I ran the wires coming from the two solar arrays into one end of the isolator, and the wires going to the charge controllers on the other end. For us, the left two terminals are for the ground deploy array and the MPPT-25060, and the right two terminals are for the roof array and the MPPT-130. Now this is a bit hard to see in this video since all of these wires are the same size and colors, but just refer to the wiring diagram for this system for additional clarification if needed. I stripped the insulation back on each of these wires and put them into their appropriate terminals on top and bottom, now, in this isolator, each pole is simply connected top to bottom with the isolator turned on, so lining the proper wires up top to bottom is all that's necessary here. Next, I can put the solar isolator cover in place and make sure that the isolator is turned off. At this point, I could reconnect the MC4 connectors for the rooftop solar array. Now that everything in this system is completely wired up, we can turn the system on and make sure that it works. Now after spending a fair amount of time quadruple checking that all of my positive wires are connected to positive terminals and negative wires are connected to negative terminals, it's time for the most anxiety inducing part of the entire install, connecting battery power. And it works. Now is a great time to go around and flip some lights and check some outlets and make sure that everything works as expected. Now that everything works as expected, it's time to program the system, and that's coming up next. Now that the system is up and running, we need to program the system so that our Victron equipment delivers the proper voltages to our batteries based on Battleborn's recommended parameters. To program the smart solar charge controllers, we have to use the Victron Connect app and select the charge controller that we're wanting to program. 
We're starting with rooftop solar array, which is the 130. Once we are in the charge controller screen, I can then navigate to the device settings menu and change the name of the charge controller to something more memorable. From there, I can navigate to the battery charging settings. Now, instead of going over the settings line by line, I'm just going to put the settings that I'm using in the video description. And lastly, I'll use this charge controller to set up the VE Smart network. And then it's time to move over to the other charge controller. So back out to the main Victron Connect screen. Select the next charge controller, which in our case is the 25060. Change the name to something more memorable. Change the battery charging settings. and then join the VE network that we set up with the first charge controller. Now the MultiPlus comes from Battleborn with the settings already correct for their batteries, but in the event that you need to access the settings, you'll need to plug an RJ45 cable into the VE bus port of the MultiPlus. Plug the other end into a Victron MK3 USB adapter, plug in a USB cord, USB adapter, and then into your phone or laptop. From there, we can access the MultiPlus, similar to the MPBTs. For the settings, Victron only wants trained professionals accessing this menu, so if you aren't a trained professional, just skip forward 20 seconds or so, so you can't see the password that I'm putting in right now. Now, same story as before. I'll leave Battleborn's recommended settings in the video description below. Lastly is the Link Shunt. And this one we actually program over at the Touch 70 GX. Navigate to the Link Shunt settings page. And then put in the proper charging settings. Now the Serbo GX and the Touch 70 GX are incredibly, incredibly detailed. And it's sort of like asking, how do you use a computer? There's a lot more to the system, but we're not going to talk about it in this video. The user manuals are incredibly detailed and have a ton of information, so start there, but we'll be covering more of these systems in future videos. Now that the system has been programmed, let's test the system. Now you've already seen the puck lights turn on, but let's dive into system testing just a bit more. I pull the van out into the sun to see how our solar panels are charging, and it's really overcast today, unfortunately, so we aren't seeing great performance, but we are still seeing about 106 watts coming in from our 580 watt solar array, which is expected for the weather conditions that we have. Power is coming from the sun to our solar panels and then to our MPPT 130 charge controller at about 36 volts. The charge controller is converting those 36 volts down to 26.2 volts to charge our 24 volt battery bank at a rate of 3.9 amps. We can also see this power coming into our system on our Touch 70 display. Now let's set up our ground deploy solar array. I have this wire I've made with the other end of the 2-pin DC connector I showed earlier in this video, and that's on one end, and on the other end is MC4 connectors. It's 30 foot long and is simply red and black 10 gauge solar wire inside of wire loom with heat shrink on the ends of the loom to make it look a little nicer and keep the wires protected. I've set four 100 watt solar panels out in the sun and connected them all in series, which means connecting the positive and negative wires of neighboring panels together and then connecting the ends to our ground deploy solar wire. Now I'll turn my solar isolator off and the other end of that wire goes into the auxiliary solar port we've installed on the side of the van. With the panels connected, we can then turn them right side up and turn the solar isolator to on, and they should start to charge. Power is coming from the sun to our ground deploy solar panels uh, to our MPPT25060 charge controller at about 80 volts. The charge controller is converting that 80-ish volts down to 26 volts to charge our 24 volt battery bank at a rate of, unfortunately, only one amp on this nice and cloudy day. We can also see this power coming into the system on our Touch 70 display. While we're outside charging things, let's go ahead and plug into shore power. 
I'm going to use my 30 amp to 15 amp adapter to plug my 30 amp shore power cord into a standard 15 amp household outlet since I don't have a full 30 amp shore power connection here at our shop just yet. The other end goes into our 30 amp shore power inlet on the side of the van. Now with the multi plus set to on, we can see that we are indeed charging from shore power. 120 volt shore power is coming into the van and going through the Victron multi plus inverter charger, which is converting that 120 volt AC power to 26 volts DC to charge our 24 volt battery bank. Now let's go ahead and turn the multi plus off and disconnect from shore power for now. Now with the multi plus set to on and all of our 120 volt breakers in the on position, we can plug something into one of our 120 volt outlets. Now since we're disconnected from shore power, our touch 70 is showing our battery bank sending 24 volt power out to our inverter charger and the inverter function is converting that 24 volt DC power to 120 volt AC power and sending it through the breaker box to our 120 volt outlets. Next, let's test Power Assist. Power Assist adds power from the battery bank to an underperforming shore power connection. I've set our shore power input current limit to only pull 7.5 amps from shore power since I've got other things on that circuit we're plugged into. This tells our MultiPlus to pull no more than 7.5 amps to power our devices and charge our battery bank from shore power. Now I'm going to plug in this space heater and turn it on high. I can see that the space heater is pulling a little over 1200 watts from the system. 7.5 amps, or 834 watts of that, is coming from shore power, and the remaining of that is actually coming from our batteries. Power assist is why we use 10 gauge wire for shore power and 6 gauge wire for the multi plus to breaker box connection. Shore power can provide 30 amps from a 30 amp shore power pedestal, and then power assist can add the rated wattage of the inverter to that, which is another 20-ish amps at 120 volts. Now I'll turn off the heaters and disconnect from shore power. Next up is our small 12 volt loads. Now we already saw our 12 volt loads power our puck lights in the ceiling, so we know that they're working, uh, but now we can check the Touch 70 to see how much power they're drawing when I turn the switch off and on. 24 volt power is coming from our battery bank and the Orion 24 volt to 12 volt converter is converting that 24 volt power down to 12 volts and sending it to both of our 12 volt fuse blocks to power these things like our lights and our max air fan. Next, let's check our 24 volt DC nomadic air conditioner. Our 24 volt battery bank is sending 24 volt DC power directly to the air conditioner through the Lynx distributor and it's working perfectly. We can now check that on our touch 70 to see that when we turn the air conditioner on, the power usage does indeed jump up to show the air conditioner being powered. Now before we wrap this video up, I want to give a special thanks to Battleborn Batteries for not only sponsoring this video, but this entire build series. From floors to walls to this electrical system, none of these videos we are making for all of you here on Explorers.life would have been possible without their continued support. But also I want to thank you for sticking around for this whole video and for letting us be a part of your projects. We hope you learned something new today and we will see you in the next video.